So thank you all for um, many of you coming back or for coming in today. Uh, this is the second day. Uh, my name is John Matsusaka. I was introduced yesterday, so we are skipping the introduction again today. These are designed to be standalone lectures, um, and so hopefully everything that we talk about today will make sort of sense to you on the other days. But I'm going to recap for one minute at the beginning just uh, to go over a few basic things. What is direct democracy? We, we need to make sure we're talking about the same, the same term. I took this, this, this slide up last time. But when we're talking about direct democracy, uh, we are talking about uh, a way of making public decisions where, where people get to vote on the actual laws that are, um, that are important. And I put an example up here from California from November, which was vote on a marijuana legalization law that actually passed. Uh, and so the, the context was, uh, we talked a bit last time about the, the satisfaction that has emerged in the last few years about, about governments uh, in, in the United States uh, and in other, in other countries of, of Western Europe as well. Um, and it's, it's very interesting if you listen to the political candidates, for example, uh, uh, last, last fall. Um, in, in many elections in the past, the, the candidates would have been staking out very strong positions for their, uh, in some sense, for their, for their partisan, uh, uh, partisan or partnership or policy. So, for example, the Republican candidate might have argued, well, we need to have smaller government for this sort of reason. We need to cut taxes. So the Democrats might have argued we need to have you know, more effective programs and so forth. So a lot of the dialogue wasn't about that last year. That was there to some extent. But a lot of the dialogue was actually about we have to get control of the government. It's being taken over by, by, these, by these special interests. Um, and they differ who the special interests were, but, but a lot of the dialogue wasn't in the, in the traditional vein of talking about specific policies, but more of this urgency was coming out of the government, the government had been taken away from the people in some sense. And what I tried to say, I showed some, um, some data last time suggesting that this feeling that, that, uh, that people have that the government is it's slipping out of their control is something that's been building for a long time. It goes way back uh, to the 1950s, and I think this public opinion data is showing that people, people believe that they're actually in control of government and it's gradually been declining for about, six, about 70 years. I also tried to suggest that this, this wasn't just the people having a temper tantrum or, or, or the people feeling uh, uh, you know, misunderstanding the way the system is working, but there's things structurally happening uh, within the way government works that is actually leading us to be less responsive to, to, to uh, public opinion. And I went through a list of things last time, I'm not going to repeat here, but I think one of the most, one of the most, one of the most important was uh, the rise of the administrative state. They said they can take this And so as, as our governments have become increasingly complicated, the, the, the parts of the government that are supposed to make the laws and that are most directly accountable to the people, which is the Congress and legislatures, uh, have gradually turned over a lot of lawmaking authority to administrative agencies. So it's just technically complicated material. I give the example of state drinking water regulations uh, last, last time, which have been turned over largely to, to the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level. But the Congress has passed a law, essentially stated its desire how the drinking water be safe and clean, but then it really turns all over the details of actually how to do that, all the rules that actually implement that is to, to the bureaucracy. And, and uh, they suggested, so bureaucrats are not directly accountable, they're indirectly accountable, but you start to put layers between them and, and, uh, and, and uh, the and accountable parts of, of the democratic system. And that's, that's one of the reasons. I also suggest that similar things are happening in courts. Uh, the courts are getting more power, and of course they're not a, 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 a elected part of the so there's some real things going on. They're happening perhaps for good reasons. It, uh, some people are, are angry at the administrative state. They want to roll back to the time when Congress passed all the law. I actually don't think that's a very realistic way to think about, uh, about the way it's to do things. Um, so we are, we're stuck to better or worse with a lot of government decisions being made by experts. The question is, can we nevertheless make government more, more accountable? So in some sense, preserve, preserve some of these um, benefits of specialization, but nevertheless give people more, more control. And that's where direct democracy is. Because direct democracy is a system which is set up to let the people vote directly on laws, and those can be 
brought conceptual things like like this, is marijuana going to be legal? But it can also have a lot of details in it. So there were some details in this legislation too about how to be regulated and how to be taxed as well. So there's a variety of ways you can you can do that. And what I want to talk about today is uh, a number of the objections that have been raised to to, to making decisions in, in this way. But, but just remember terms. Um, since there's a bunch of terms in here that sometimes people get confused, the main distinction uh, or a broad distinction between types of direct democracy is 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 in who originates the law. Does a law does a law originally come from the government or does the law come from uh, from the people in the form of a petition? Uh, so when it, the law is come, coming from the government, I'm going to call that a referendum. Uh, People use different words, but that's the most common thing. So there's advisory referendums. Brexit is perhaps the best known example of that. Uh, Governments have been doing advisory referendums for some time. Uh, there's mandatory referendums, uh, which are very common in the United States. A mandatory referendum means before the government takes certain sorts of actions, it must go to the people for approval. Uh, and these are very common to see on things like debt issues. Uh, um, we think back to the, 18th, to the mid 1800s that many states and cities were required to get voter approval before they need to get uh, these, uh, these have been applied to sp uh, spending increases. So in, in Switzerland, most of the state and local governments require voter approval uh, before new spending programs are initiated. Um, we also see these for tax increases. There's a bunch of different ways that you can do a mandatory referendum. The most common is, is for constitutional amendments. Uh, every state but one requires that it's constitutional to amendments to the state constitution be approved by the voters. Uh, so that's a very common thing as well. Uh, petition referendum is the last kind of referendum. It's not used all that often, but it essentially allows the citizens to challenge laws that the government has passed. They don't like something that the government did, they can click signatures, put it on the ballot, and potentially repeal it. So that's a third thing. The other broad group of, uh, of uh, uh, the other broad group of direct democracy is what's called the initiative. Initiative is the most high profile one. We'll be talking a fair amount about the initiative, uh, and it's also potentially the most impactful uh, because it allows the citizens themselves to, to propose a law. Uh, so they can come up with an idea, collect signatures, put it on the ballot, and it happens to become a law. So this marijuana legalization measure is exactly of, of that form. It wasn't put on there because the government wanted to get an opinion on that, it was because some citizen groups couldn't get the legislature to even consider this, so they just let this initiative and they just report through the, the voting staff opinion and we that. Um, but so initiatives are potentially the most impactful because they're allowed voters to actually take on the state. Mm -hmm. What I tried to suggest last time is that there's a, a, a notion sometimes that direct democracy is an unusual sort of uh, small part of the political space. It doesn't happen very often. It happens only in a few isolated places like California and Brexit and so forth. But I try to suggest that that's really not a good way to, to think about it. You want to carry that picture around in your head because, in fact, direct democracy is used all over the country. It's used all over the globe. And it's been used for a long time. And I went back through a history of the, of the U.S. and a very abbreviated history. Um, it was Luis was asking me last time about other countries. So I, I pulled this, this slide out, which I was going to skip, but, but I, I had it. So, so there it is. Um, well, there's a there. Um, one group has actually collected how many national referendums have there been old, uh, from 2000 to 2010. They haven't updated, obviously the updates have been more, but it's sort of the 21st century. Uh, and so there were uh, um, 30 in Asia, 20, uh, 35 in Africa, 44 in the Americas, and, and so forth. So these are national referendums. Obviously, if you went subnational, you get, you get a lot, a lot more. Uh, the number four, uh, Europe is a bit uh, misleading because a lot of those are coming out of Switzerland with sort of routinely, routinely does this. But nevertheless, there are still a, a fair amount of these things happening. In the um, so this is just to try to suggest that, again, this isn't a one-off thing. Uh, uh, Brexit, of course, was something very distinctive, but one shouldn't think that it's the first time this has ever happened. We can, we can okay, so that's a, a, a very abbreviated uh, uh, review of what we talked about last time. What I want to talk about this time mm -hmm. is the criticisms of direct democracy, because there are many criticisms of it. And I want to go through the, the evidence, the, the scientific evidence. Uh, this, uh, this talk is, is, is sponsored by the State Center here at the University of Chicago, and of course looking at data is a very central um, part of the way I, I think the center and the university think about how you do policy evaluation. So there's been a lot of research done on, on this topic, and I'm going to try to extract pieces of it. I'm saying I can't do just the whole thing, but I'm going to extract some key studies and some key pieces of evidence to uh, so let you see what you think. Just, just to frame it, uh, and I, I'm going to talk about direct democracy, excuse me, direct democracy many times. Uh, somebody always brings up the founders, and they say, look, the founders established the republic. They didn't want a democracy, they didn't like democracy. 
Uh, and I think that's, that's right, in some sense. Some of the founders were very suspicious of democracy. Uh, they spent a lot of time reading history, and they had had some stories about the ancient Greeks and so forth, and how, how things were bad. And I just put a couple quotes up here to, to kind of frame the discussion. Uh, John Adams, of course, is second president of the United States. He was one of the absolute central guys in the founding of the country. Uh, he said democracy, and what they mean by this really is direct democracy here, um, uh, not what we have here uh, in the U.S. But it means sort of uh, direct democracy, or direct forms of direct, direct democracy to generate an anarchy. Um, John Marshall was the first justice, uh, the chief justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. He has a similar thing. It's essentially chaos if you allow people to make direct decisions. So, so some of the founders felt very strongly that the decisions need to be filtered through through representatives. Just, I'm going to come back at the very end. And this, this wasn't a unanimous view among the founders. Sometimes it's, it's suggested that the founders all, all felt like this. Um, in fact, Thomas Jefferson, I think, was a very reserved. I think he would have embraced a lot of these. But I'll, I'll come back to that later on. So, so, so what are the problems with direct, direct democracy? Let's, let's walk through it. Okay, the, the first issue that always comes up is a question which is called voter confidence. Do, you know, do ordinary people really know enough in order that, uh, to, to make uh, important public decisions? So what do we know about this? Well, we know first of all that, uh, well, let, let me say, uh, let me say this slight slide. The answer to this depends partly on how we voter confidence. What do we know about voters? We know from a long line of research that if you go out there and you quiz voters and you ask them detailed questions about candidates they're voting on, if you ask them even things about the structure of the U.S. government, they they fail. You know, almost all the time, they, they can't answer the basic questions. Um, uh, for sure, if you ask them detailed questions about ballot propositions that they're voting on, most of them um, probably can't answer uh, very accurately those questions. Uh, but what research has 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 taught us. And I think fairly convincingly is that that's probably not the right way to think about what we mean by being a competent voter. Uh, what we really mean by being a competent voter is that when you go in there and you check a box, you actually check the box that reflects your interests. Uh, so what's the difference between those two? Uh, the, the difference is uh, that you can check your interests or you can find a way to, to uh, vote your interests without actually knowing the details of the things you vote. So let me give you an example. Suppose there's a, a, a proposed law, there's a ballot proposition that's called the, the Forest Preservation Measure. And let's suppose that you are an environmentalist. So your question is, is this law going to preserve forests? Or is it something that the timber industry put on there under a, under a nice competing title that will like, actually allow them to cut down more trees? Uh, so one way you could try to figure that out is to read through the technical language of the law, which is actually very hard, even if you're an expert in trying to understand. The other way you could figure out what to do is you could go look at what does an expert that you trust say. So what does the Sierra Club say? Because okay, they have people that can actually read it and actually assess whether it's going to be good or bad. And you can look at whether if it says, uh, Sierra Club says no, then you can actually vote your interest very accurately. But you're going to fail if I actually quiz you on exactly any of the details of the law. And what this, this has been called uh, the use of cues or information shortcuts. Uh, that is, uh, voters can actually make the right decision as long as they have a cue or an information shortcut. If they have an information source they trust, um, that they can make the right decision. Now note that even if you are, let's suppose that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a timber industry uh, enthusiast. That's what I care about. I can still use the Sierra Club's recommendation to tell me which way to vote, because I know I want to go opposite there. Uh, so some people feel like that when they read newspaper endorsements. If they're not on the left, because most newspapers have, have, are more on the left, if you're on the, more on the right, you go, you go against your local newspaper. Uh, but you just need there to be some endorsements out there. You need there to be a newspaper you trust, or an interest group, or a politician, or somebody out there who's going to tell you, you know, you should vote yes or no. So some people don't like this. I get this. Most people acknowledge this because they think about how they vote themselves and they realize, that, okay, I, I do something, I do something like that. Uh, most people formed an opinion. Uh, you know, many people have opinions on Obamacare, let's say, for example, but they didn't actually read the 2,700 pages of it. Uh, 
Um, and I suspect, you know, I could do quizzes here, but I don't answer. I suspect nobody in this room read the 2,700 pages of Obamacare, but most of you have opinions about you think it's just that. Uh, how did that come out? Well, you, you read, in some sense, still to the opinion from some experts that, that you trust or you triangulate across, across different experts. Um, so, so, so the fact that voters can't really um, speak in detail about measures and that they don't even really attempt to try to read the details of legal language isn't really uh, isn't really a convincing argument against direct democracy. The real question is, can these cues work? Now, some people don't. Some people say, "Okay, I get the idea of cues. That sounds that sounds nice, but it, it would still be better if people didn't do that. It would still be better if we went back to the legislature where they actually read the laws uh, if, if instead." Now, the problem, of course, is that within the legislature, they don't actually read the laws either. So, who thinks Obama actually read 27 of the pages of, 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 of that law? Who thinks Republicans have read, you know, the power main pages or anything of appeal? That, that's not the way it works. How, how do they make it? Easier? Well, there are experts that are reading it. There are people they trust. They can be, um, they can be um, donors, uh, interest groups that they're aligned, aligned with. Uh, if, you know, if I'm a Democratic senator and I'm very pro-environment, I might ask the Air Club to take a look at some of this legislation and tell me what their opinion should change to be in support of it or not. Um, they look at party leaders. They, there's a whole bunch of different sources, but they very rarely will, will I mean, they don't probably have the expertise to read in detail uh, all, all of these things. So if you really want people to actually be reading in detail, the people who are voting to actually be reading in detail what, what they're voting on, you're going to be displayed pretty, pretty much no matter, no matter what. That, that's not the reason. Now, I don't think we should be so worried because we do all kinds of things in life where we trust experts. Uh, <coughs> and um, we get sick and we get some drug prescribed to us. Uh, we don't go read the studies uh, to try to determine whether it's medically efficacious. We trust the doctors and somebody who's, who's examined the study. Um, I think the whole world, we, 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 we rely on other experts to advise us to try to find people that we trust. So I, I don't think we should feel really bad if, if, as voters if we're not actually reading this in detail, if we're sort of sure that people. I don't think that's, that's required. What we need to do is reflect what we believe. And so uh, we can try to do it with the key. The question with legislators about such So let me show you some evidence on this because this is all very hypothetical. You might say, well, that sounds good. Uh, how does this work? So let me show you what I think is a, the most interesting study that's been done on this. This was a study done uh, by uh, Arthur Lupia, at, now at, at the University of Michigan. So there was a really interesting set of five propositions in the state of California in 1988, I believe. Um, and they all had to do with uh, auto insurance regulation. The background of this was that uh, auto insurance rates in California were among the highest in the nation. There was a lot of um, complaints amongst consumers uh, about this, uh, and there was a lot of education within the legislature to get something done. Uh, but uh, auto insurance regulation in involves two of the main special interest uh, titans uh, in state government, and that's the auto insurance companies and the tribal owners. Uh, and they had different views of what what they wanted to do. Uh, in California, for reasons I don't quite understand, the insurance, inco insurance companies have been granted an antitrust exemption from state antitrust law. Uh, the the tribes wanted to take that away. The insurance companies wanted to take away the ability of lawyers to bring a lot of these lawsuits and to get contingency fees and to get paid and stuff like that. So they had different solutions to bring the race down. They kept fighting. They didn't end up doing anything at all. So a citizen group decided, well, forget this. We're just going to do our own proposals. So they put, they went out and collected, they wrote it up, they went out and collected their signatures. And this took away the antitrust assumption, and it, it uh, reduced rates uh, across the board by 20%, and it required approval for all, all rate increases. It was a very, you know, very, uh, uh, neither, neither group like this. Uh, but they put this on the ballot. Uh, then the groups got very alarmed, and so the trial lawyers jumped in, they put a counter initiative on, which would went down their path, uh, and then the insurance in industry jumped very aggressively. They put three different proposals on, three different three different ways to reform. <coughs> the bottom line all this, the voters ended up with five uh, ins auto insurance regulation proposals on the ballot at the same time. Those are the numbers, the top 100, 101, 103, and so on. Uh, and then a ton of money was spent. Uh, the, the, uh, the two sides, uh, or three sides spent, I think it was $82 million on propositions that year. That doesn't sound like very much money now. Um, but that same year, 1988, um, when George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush, won the election, uh, his entire presidential campaign spent $80 million. 
Okay, so more was spent on these five measures than, than President Bush spent on this whole campaign. Chicago spent 73 million. Um, so a ton of money was spent on this. Voters walk in to seeing a, a, what would seem to be a fairly confusing situation. In addition, in addition to these five measures, there were 25, uh, excuse me, 22 other propositions on the ballot. Plus, they had to vote for president and senator for the whole so the people wanted to understand, you know, how do voters, how do voters, how, how do voters think about this? If you read them, they're all very technical. A lot of insurance regulations have a lot of technical components. They look kind of the same. They were all um, um, frosted with some nice, uh, nice tasting language up front that made them all sound like, like they were good. They were good ideas. So how do people sort through this? Well, he wanted to do something. Uh, he wanted to distinguish the use of information from the use of the So what he did is he had people outside the polls, so people came out to vote, uh, out for voting. He had people ask some questions about how much they knew about the measures they were voting on and about whether they had received any cues, if they, they, they knew the endorsements of people. And in particular, what he did is he first of all asked them a set of, quest set of questions about the details of the things they were voting on so that he could sort people into those who actually knew the details of each of the propositions. Which one is going to be no fault insurance? Which one is going to do this? Which one is going to do this? So he was able to break people into two groups. And group one is the informed people. And then group two is uninformed. If you ask them, they couldn't really tell you what the difference between one and two and The other thing they asked is they said, they said, do you know an information cue? And particularly asked three information cues. Do you know what Ralph Nader thinks about these issues? Which one he's sworn against? Do you know which one the auto insurance likes, the uh, auto insurance industry likes, and do you know uh, which one the trial lawyers like? So that's just, so, so those are people who knew the keys. So as a benchmark, what I put up here, these are the votes received by the voters who were informed. Okay, so these are the guys who can actually ask, answer the detailed questions about, about them. And you can see most of them like Prop 103, uh, that's the one that actually passed, that was the consumers on uh, the, other, the other four fans. Uh, so, so this is what the informed voters said. And again, so Prop 100, like 53 percent of them said they favored that or voted for that, and so forth. So, you want to compare that with two other groups. And the first group was the people that were uninformed, so they, they couldn't tell you in, they couldn't tell you what each measure did, and they didn't have any of the keys. Okay, they didn't know what Ralph was doing. And so you can see here's their voting pattern. They tend to vote no on most things, but it's, it's totally different. The most interesting group was the people who were uninformed. If you quiz them and ask them details about the proposition, they couldn't answer. But they could tell you what Ralph Nader thought of what the auto insurance industry the trial lawyers thought. And his question was, how well the cues work is compared to people who have information? So here's what he found about the voting patterns of these uninformed people who have cues. <laughs> Okay. So, this, so this is a really uh, I, this is a really a, a amazing study. Uh, it, it's clever the way he, he, he designed it. But I think it's it's it's, it's fascinating what, what he found. Um, since then, there have been other studies which have tried to find this. This is this is sort of one of the better cases it turns out for for people having cues. But but the general point is here is that this idea that cues can work is more than theoretical. There's actually evidence that it does. That people are able to use these to navigate uh, through information things reasonably well. Okay, so uh, again, there's more evidence, but uh, let me put my disclaimer that I gave last time, which I feel bad about. There's, there's so much research out there, and there's so much interesting things one could do a whole you know, couple of hours on just one of these topics, but I have to just extract out a, cool, a few of what I think are the coolest studies. So I'm going to fly through it quickly and as much, and you don't have to think too hard anyway. Uh, so, so, on a, so that's what I'm going to, I'm going to say on cues. I, I tried to, want to give you the basic idea. But I think the basic idea holds up reasonably well. Um, there is a really important policy implication out of this, though. It's that if you want voters to be able to make wise decisions in these elections, they must have cues available, and they must be able to access them. And so it's really important that uh, uh, groups are allowed to communicate. So there has to be adequate campaign advertising. Uh, that's one of the ways this information gets out. Um, ideally, ideally, uh, Perhaps even the government will provide some of this information. Say, here's the people that are for, here's the people who are against. This is the case in California. Um, uh, but you want to make sure that that everybody gets to hear who, who's for and against. If you have very one-sided or no information that flows, then you can actually have um, uh, bad decisions. And I, and I put that out there because people often 
don't like campaigns and they want to shut it down. They don't. They don't want this to happen. But I think it'd be very dangerous given the way that people make decisions if you don't allow them this to happen. Yeah. So if the uninformed voters are a large majority, I don't know if they are or not. So that would, that's my question. <coughs> then the um, the fact that the that the ones who know the views agree with each other, whether they're informed or not, makes no difference because they'll be dominated by the uninformed ones who don't know anything. If there's too many of these people, the whole system breaks down. Right. And so, what, and so, you, I think they're exactly right. What this doesn't show is that it works. It shows that it can't. It, it, the cues can work. Um, but clearly, what has to happen is the cues have to get get out, get out to voters. So, do we do we have any idea how many, what fraction of people are in each of those? Yeah. He did have it. I don't. I'm sorry, I don't recall it. But I, there's the reference there. If you want to, if you want to dig it out, I don't. I don't he, he, he recorded. Okay. So, so let me go on in, in the interest of time. Let me talk about another criticism. Uh, so, so that's the one about about vote, about voter competence, and I think it's it's pretty clear from the evidence that voters uh, can behave uh, competently. Um, what about the issue of our voters' responsibility? So this came up said came up last time. Sometimes people think voters are are um, sort of like children, uh, and that if you let them vote, they will say um, vote yes on every spending program that gives them something, and vote yes on every tax spending program that cuts their taxes. Uh, you know, it, it, as if voters don't understand that things have to add up. Uh, and of course, if you think about yourself and most of the people you know, people we're not that we're not that that, that silly. Um, but nevertheless, there's uh, there's a possibility that these things could be known. So let me show you a little bit of evidence on this. Uh, it's very hard to say what's responsible, so it's it's not uh, it's, it's it's not possible to um, or at least nobody's really figured out a good way to do this directly. But what but what people have looked at extensively, and I've done a lot of work on this too, is what do voters act, actually do, and do they seem like they're choosing policies that don't add up? Um, let, let me just tell you the, the punchline. The punchline is when voters go in and they're allowed to make fiscal decisions, they tend to behave very conservative. Um, they, they tend, if anything, to cut down spending, they cut down debt. They, 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 they seem to be able to fairly fiscally conservative. Right? So it doesn't look like what you're saying picture of your responsibility is. So it, it, yes. this is U.S. base. Or? U.S. base. Yes. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this also includes Switzerland. There's a lot of data from Switzerland, actually, and a little bit from Germany. But those, I know those are the countries you want to do that to. Specific of. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, U.S. and Switzerland have been extensively studied, and that's that's very much the case. There's an emerging literature in Germany which shows that uh, at the local level that's happening. Is there any referendum you have to make on these issues? Uruguay does them all the time, but nobody, for some reason, has not looked at it. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it would be interesting. Okay, so let me just, I'm just gonna again show you little pieces here. Uh, what this is, uh, and you can find more more on this in a stabler Center working paper that I did, which is just to, to, to survey the literature, but here's a figure. This just shows you the difference in uh, spending uh, within the United States between states that allow uh, citizens to initiate laws in, in states and don't. So it's direct democracy states versus non-direct democracy states. After controlling for a variety of things, controlling for income, controlling for population size, controlling for measures of ideology, so controlling for some sort of regression for those people want to know. Um, and this just shows the difference. And the way to understand it is that, for example, in the most recent year, which I think is 2014, down here, initiative states were spending about, uh, as a fraction of income, about, I don't know, eight tenths of a percent less than the other issues. Uh, and states, as a percentage of income, probably spend about 10 or 15 percent total. So that's sort of the um, And so what you can see here, uh, th there's a long discussion. For those of you who are more into this dollar part of this, there was a whole bunch of issues about cause causality here, how much we want to assign causality to these sort of things. I'm not going to do any of that, of that here. But there's reasonable, there's good reason to believe that the initiative process has something to do with these patterns. And, um, it's, it, it's not always. But you can see that for most of for most of the last 50 years or so, initiative states tend to adopt uh, less less spending and less taxes than, than, than non initiative states. Uh, and people look at that as a similar pattern pop up for, for Switzerland as well. Uh, there's, also, um, there's also a lot of studies that have looked at mandatory referendums on particular items. So remember what a mandatory referendum means. Anytime you want to do a new issue with something, you have to give them approval. So uh, mandatory referendums on debt, so there have been studies of U.S. states, Swiss cities, and cross-national studies. Uh, U.S. studies of debt, the studies vary. I like some of them better than others. Um, I wouldn't bet on any particular one, but there's a lot of them now. But the estimates range from, uh, from minus 10 to minus 
25 percent, that is, that is debt levels tend to be lower when voters have to approve them uh, by rather significant amounts. So what's the true number in there? I, again, I don't, I wouldn't um, commit to any one study, but, yeah, but I'm pretty convinced that the number is, is negative and not a non trivial. Uh, similarly, research on spending, uh, notes, this is again data from U.S. school districts, Swiss, Swiss campus, cross national, there's a bunch of studies on this, show that when voters have to improve spending, uh, that also tends to be lower, minus two, and minus five. And minus two is actually an outlier, so if I guess the real number, it's about 10 or 15 percent. So, so there's a, a whole bunch of evidence of this kind of flavor where people look at how policies how policy, they look at policies in areas that allow direct democracy, policies in areas that don't. They try to control for a bunch of other things to see, um, you know, if it's serious. But, the, but there's a pretty general finding that suggests that you get more fiscally conservative outcomes in areas that have direct democracy. Okay, so so that's um, continuing on on the, on the uh, irresponsibility. This is somewhat indirect. It just suggests that voters are somewhat uh, conservative. Let me show you another thing which I think it may be in your mind because it often, it often comes up. There's this idea out there that if you allow citizens to directly make these fiscal decisions, they, they paint you into a corner by uh, allocating money, uh, but then tying your hands and not allowing you to raise taxes to pay for so, so this is the common view. And I became very intrigued by this because I kept reading a bunch of comments. So here's one from Laura Tyson that was in business <coughs> Uh, Laura Tyson was a, a chairman of Council of Economic Advisors uh, for, for a while. Um, for, for the Clinton, I, I mean, um, uh, but there's been a lot, a lot of comments on this. But it's, I just uh, often claim that the, the California is ungovernable because there's so much direct money. And I became very intrigued by this because I kept seeing this reported. In fact, I, there are specific numbers that are like, like 70%. And so I started reaching out to these folks and saying, where do you get this number from? How do you, how do you actually calculate it? Uh, and, and nobody could actually tell me. Uh, they got it from another pundit, is, is, what, it, is what it turned out. They, they, they read it from somebody else. Uh, so that intrigued me. So I said, well, let me just find out what the number actually is by directly doing it myself. Uh, so what I did uh, is I went back to, uh, I have a big list of all the initiatives in all the states that have been passed. I took all California's initiatives that have been passed. I picked out all the ones that can be <coughs> I just told them how much money they committed. And, and I got a table like this. So for example, the way to read this is that there was a proposition in 1988, Prop 98, that was about education. And it, uh, as of 2010, the most recent version of this thing was done, as of 2010, it had locked in about $35 billion. Okay, so that was sort of taken off the table before the state even started. And you can see there was a mental health initiative that locked in $1.7 billion and so forth. Uh, okay, so so this is it. Uh, Counted up all these initiatives, uh, just very directly added them up. This is an uh, incredibly simple exercise. What does it come out to be? Well, the total amount, this is as of 2010, the last time I did this, as of 2010, $39 million had been committed by initiatives. And the state's uh, overall spending that year was $119 million. So the number that was locked in was, in fact, 33%. Uh, and so that's still that's that's that seems like it's a non-trivial amount. That, that's a big chunk of the budget that is committed. But there's a, but this number is deceptively large. It's actually the amount of money that's committed is actually much larger than that. And the reason is, as you can see, almost all the action is one proposition. Okay, the first one, the one at the very top there, Prop 98 is where all the action is coming in. That's committing 35 of the 39 billion dollars. Well, what that what that proposition does is it says the state must must spend at least a certain fraction of its budget every year on, on education. And the number is pegged to be essentially the historical average. So, so what this proposition does is it says it's, it's committing the state to, state to spend an amount of money that it always spent anyway in the past. So, so even though it's sort of locked in, it's, 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 it's locked in in a very weak way because it's, it's, it's sort of incomprehensible the state would go below this number in any material way. Uh, if you take that out, of course, only about you know a couple percent of the budget is actually is actually uh, so, so I don't think there's very good evidence on the spending side that the state's hands are tied. On on the revenue side, the evidence is even stronger. Uh, 
there is one big proposition which I'll talk at length about um, uh, tomorrow, which is Proposition 13, which restricts, which restricts property taxes. But property taxes are really not an important source of revenue for state governments. Uh, state governments mainly raise their revenue from um, personal income taxes and sales taxes and corporate income taxes. Uh, and there's no initial restrictions on any of those uh, so, so I, I'm bringing this up because people often use, you know, California as a case study for why the people are irresponsible. If you actually look at the facts and not just look at what people say and repeat each other, if you actually look at the facts, it's not, it's not actually the case. That California. But the corollary to this is the contradiction. So, if you have a 1988 mandate that says you have to spend 35 million, you have to spend the average on education, and then you have Proposition 13 that says. Um, Property taxes need to be slashed. The property taxes in most states are the source of funding for education. You're putting the state into sort of a, uh, a headlock in terms of, well, how are they going to spend that minimum amount of education every year if they're restricted from uh, spending or from or from taxing property taxes? And then you've got them turning around and saying, well, in all contradictory, we won't let you uh, uh, issue debt. So there's, you know, you have contradictory. It would be interesting if, if someone looked at those kinds of victory over time and say, um, we're voting yes on this and we're voting yes on this and they're in cross purposes because because you're not going to be able to accomplish your own. So, yeah, so you can, uh, so the property taxes aren't zeroed out. They're, they're, they're just restricted in, in some way. But property taxes are really not a driver of those, but they're not a central revenue for the state. So uh, they are important to some extent for local, for local governments. They're usually the source, though, for education. So, for like in Illinois, for for, for part of it, yeah. Uh, but states, states, states top it off. Um, I mean, what what happened here is, in some sense, the voters took away that particular revenue source in the state and came in with, with other. Right. If that, if the voters can see that, so, and that's what would be yeah. interesting is, can the voters really see the holistic picture when they vote on individual propositions yeah. over time? Yeah. And, and and there is that that has to be approved. Voters do voters do approve that issues too. Um, so it's not that they always say no, they, 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 they pick and choose. Um, um, and there hasn't been really well studied which ones they approve and which ones don't. But they're perfectly happy to borrow, sometimes too happy for my case, but you know, that's, 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 that's democracy. Um, um, but they're not, they're not crazy about it. They understand that sometimes if you want to build school buildings, you need to borrow to do it. And so they will pretty well do it. Okay, so, so yeah, there's obviously more to say on this, and I don't mean by any of these things to any of these things are confusing. I'm just trying to give you a little piece of that. But I tried to track this one down as best I could, and then it turned out to be much less good. Than, uh, uh, um, okay, other other criticisms about uh, direct democracy. So one criticism about direct democracy is is you know special interests are going to be able to take advantage of the process. They have the money to run the campaigns, to collect signatures, and so forth, and so you'll be empowered with special interests. So I wrote a whole book on this a few years ago, which tried to make, uh, which, which tried to collect data on the fiscal side of things, and I, I couldn't really find much evidence to support it to, to the contrary. But let me show you some different evidence here, and I and, and here's sort of an example of a common view, which, which uh, so this comes from David Broder, who was a very eminent journalist, uh, and so what he posted to pass away. Also, I think a uh, Chicago graduate uh, at, uh, at, at one point. Um, but he wrote, a, he wrote a book, and he did what journalists do, um, which is very good. He went around the country, he talked to a lot of people who ran these campaigns, he, he wrote a lot about their experiences, and he came up with this conclusion here, that special interests have learned how to subvert the process to their own, to their own purposes. And he was particularly noting that they, 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 knew, they were doing focus groups before they, before they ran propositions, and they were paying attention to the words they were using in the right campaigns and stuff. And then he therefore concluded that, well, this, then this process is bad because it's helping the special interests. Um, the problem with that way of thinking is that it, it's not really being very clear about what is compared against. And what do I mean by that? Well, it's, there's no doubt that within direct democracy that wealthy interests have probably more weight than you and me. Well, you might be wealthy interests, but, you know, the most of us. Okay. There, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but that's also true within the legislative process. Okay, so wealthy interests, we have a ton of research. In fact, this, this is one thing the Stigler Center has been very interested in, and in particular is the possibility that sort of wealthy interests might be able to get their hands on the levers and tell the playing field uh, in, in their own favor. Um, that can happen within a legislature, too. 
So, so, so saying that, you know what, I'm going to look at this one particular kind of democracy and it, and it doesn't work perfectly, therefore it's bad, isn't really, isn't really a good comparison. You can't compare to an ideal world that doesn't exist. You have to compare to the alternate, alternate real world. Uh, and the alternate real world is a world where there's only decision making by representative democracy. And so the question is not, are special interests influential, but does direct democracy increase their influence relative to what it would be or decrease their influence? And this book doesn't grapple with that, and, and I'm making this as a general point because a lot of people who talk about this don't, comp don't compare a meaningful alternative. Let me show you a couple of things that might shed light on this. There's, I have a whole, again, I have a whole book if you want to read, read, read more on that. But let me show you something newer than the book. Uh, this is something that I said a little bit about last time. Uh, I was able to, for, for 10 policies, I was able, within the state, to find out exactly what the majority view on each of these policies was. So again, I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff, so let me, and I know some of this is flashing by, but for example, death penalty. A death penalty is an issue that you can allow it or not allow it. And we actually have pretty good public opinion data, so we can determine in each state whether the majority would like to have that penalty be legal or, you know, or illegal. So in every state, for 10, in every state for 10 issues, we're able to determine whether the policy is congruent with what the majority wants or not congruent. And I mentioned last time that overall concurrence is, is low, surprisingly low to my taste, 59%. But for the purposes here, the question is how does it vary in direct democracy states versus non-direct democracy states? Because if special interests are empowered by direct democracy, then we would expect in direct democracy states the majority would there would be even less concurrence. The, the majority would even would even be less likely to get Okay, so here it is. The red line is the 59% that I already told you about, and the blue and purple are the are the average congruence rates in direct democracy states and not in direct democracy states. And what you see is that in the direct democracy states, there's actually more congruence. So the policies are more like what the majority wants. This is just means. If you, if those of you who like to do regressions and stuff, you want to control for various things, the difference is actually much, much, much bigger uh, when, you start, when you start trying to control for various things. So this, maybe will give you a flavor for what I think a number of, of studies have found, is that it actually looks like the majority is more likely to get its way in direct democracy states than in non-direct democracy states. Okay. Um, and I think the reason for that is actually not that hard to understand. Uh, if you're a special interest uh, and you, you want to influence legislators, a typical state is going to have 120 legislators or something like that. You can send in lobbyists, you can do favors for them, you can promise them money for their re-election campaign. You can work out deals with 120 people. You don't need 120 to eat half of them. You can work out deals with half of those people. It's not that hard to do. Uh, in direct democracy, you, you can't do deals because you're dealing with you know, millions of voters. So uh, so your money has is much less powerful. The main thing you can do is run a ton of commercials and try to persuade them. But ultimately, all you can do is try to persuade them. You can, of course, try to lie to them. You can try to do whatever you want. Um, but ultimately, all you have is persuasion. You don't have any ability to do sort of quid pro quo deals or help people move their careers forward and so forth. Uh, and so if you just think about it kind of on, on prior grounds, it's actually not as promising for those special interests who have a lot of money to try to persuade several million voters as it is to try to persuade small group legislators. So it's not that surprising, to, I think, that, interest, that special interests don't do as well under direct democracy. Uh, we also know that they don't like it. If you look at groups like the Chamber or large corporations, they tend to not like direct democracy. They want it, they want it to go away, um, and I think it's, it's not a coincidence. Now, if you remember, I think I mentioned the policies that I looked at in this particular study were mostly social policies, and I was trying to think more about business regulation. Uh, strangely enough, there hasn't been a lot of research on, on, on business regulation in, term, in, in this context, but I was looking at something just the other day to try to get a rough sense of it. So I try to think of an industry. I try to think of an industry that has a lot of money that we think of as being a somewhat heavy hitter, in a, but also an industry that there's a lot of initiatives about. Uh, and I thought of tobacco. Okay, so uh, uh, the tobacco industry has a lot of money, and um, there's a lot of things that they want. They don't want to be taxed. Uh, they don't want smoking to be banned. Uh, so, and these are things that some groups, some groups do want. So I was curious. So I went back to this data set I had. And I extracted all state-level propositions having to do with tobacco uh, since since the beginning, since 1930. I think the first one. And you can see over here first. The first thing is the uh, these are the number of state-level initiatives that have concerned tobacco. Uh, and there, so there's 23 in one form or another that proposed that had to do with taxes. In, in fact, in every case, it was a tax increase on tobacco. 
there were 13 proposition types of smoking bans. Most of those were um, were, were two bans. A couple were two repeal bans. Uh, there were some very old ones about whether to make cigarettes illegal or not because they thought about that. Prohibition. Uh, but I just want to get a sense of, of how does it look like tobacco does on these on these propositions. And the first thing to note is that 89% um, of these measures actually targeted the, the industry. Okay, so it wasn't the industry trying to get things. It was actually the industry was defensive in, <coughs> in almost all cases. They were being um, uh, they were being um, put under pressure. Uh, and then I looked at what were the outcomes of these, and I wanted to see how did the outcomes actually change. Did they change in favor of tobacco? industry or not a favorite tobacco industry as a result of the vote. And as you think about it, there's three things that can happen. Uh, either the policy can move more favorable to tobacco. For example, um, cigarettes are legalized when they've been previously illegal. That was one case. Uh, it could be neutral. That is, it's just a status quo. The measure gets defeated, nothing happens. Or it could be the tobacco industry is more solid. Uh, and I just counted them up. Uh, if you count them up, 58% of the actual cases ended up being worse to tobacco as a result. 39%, there was no change at all, only 3% were So it's very clear, at least this particular industry, this has just been a bad deal for tobacco. They are much able, they're much, they're going to get much better treatment from legislators than if, if citizens are allowed to bring these votes. So I think we need more systematic evidence on this particular particular an angle, um, but I just thought this would be interesting. Okay, the, the last concern that's often raised, again, I'm, I'm rapidly blasting through the main concerns that there are about the recommendations. The last concern that's often raised about is whether it endangers minority rights. Okay. Direct democracy is a, is a majoritarian in principle, and I just showed you some data showing that in practice it, does it. it helps the majority um, the, the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. system, as well as most other countries, build in very clear protections for, for minorities. They, they want to make sure that the majority doesn't tyrannize in some way the, the minority. And so it's a very natural question to ask whether um, whether, whether minorities would be in danger. There, there has been a lot of research on this question, but most of it, I think, has not been very uh, convincing. And the main reason is that they, they, don't, they don't ask this question uh, compared to what? So there are studies which will go in there and they'll find a particular ballot proposition that was unfavorable to minority rights, and they'll say, okay, well, therefore, this is a bad process that the, you know, the minority group lost in, in this case. Uh, and that is not the right way to think about it, because again, you have to say, well, compare, you know, compare to the alternative. Uh, I spent some time looking through all the initiatives that have passed. There's been several, maybe about 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, 3,000, Try to find ones that were uh, explicitly targeted or, or unfriendly to, to minority rights. And you can find a few. Uh, but if you think about the compared to what, if you think about in this country the worst things that have happened to minorities, they almost all happened through representative democracy. So think about slavery, uh, Jim Crow laws in the South, disenfranchisement of blacks, the internment of the Japanese during World War II. All those things went through representative democracy. And, and so what I think that the lesson out of that, that, partly the lesson we have to take out of that is that for minority rights are, 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 are under threat in principle under any kind of democratic system uh, because democratic systems are ultimately the idea is the majority rules in some form. So there's always going to be some danger. Uh, there's no evidence that I've really seen that suggests that you, people can point to big policies that seem to hurt, to hurt, to hurt minorities. Um, um, but there's not really been a conclusive study. It's hard thing to prove because it's a lot of absence. Yeah. I just wanted to the comment about slavery, Jim Crow laws. Uh, I feel like it's maybe subject to the same criticism that kind of compared to what, in particular, it seems like we had an instant, like institutionally, there was a representative democracy in place, but I think it's a strong claim to say that people wouldn't have been in favor of that had, uh, you know, had it been up to Absolutely. people to decide, I don't, I don't think it's fair to say that those uh, atrocities would have been avoided. A a absolutely, and, and I don't, and I, and sorry, I didn't mean to suggest that that, uh, that it wouldn't, it, it may well have happened if it was direct democracy, but on, on some things are going to, some bad things are going to happen in democracy, no matter how, how you set it up. Uh, and it's not, it, it, the, the argument against direct democracy on this one has to be that it's even more likely to happen. Uh, and what I'm really trying to say here is that we have to recognize that these things are going to happen, unfortunately, I mean, very unfortunately. Um, 
some of the best kind of indirect evidence on, on this is what do people, what do what do sort of minorities think who actually live in these, in these areas? Uh, now, uh, unfortunately, we're sort of defining minorities to be racial and ethnic groups, but that's there's other kinds of minorities that we can think about as well. Um, but there's some interesting surveys. So people have gone out, uh, particularly in California. California uses a lot of direct democracy. So one of the questions is, what do blacks, Latinos, and Asians think about direct democracy in California? Because if their rights are really um, under siege, they should not be in favor of this process. They should say, you know, I don't, I don't want this. I would rather go back to some legislature. So it's a very interesting survey to ask people, do you think, uh, here's the question, do you think statewide ballot processes are a good or a bad thing for California? And what I did is I broke it out here by, by race. Uh, and you can see that every group overwhelmingly overwhelmingly thinks that direct democracy is a good thing. Uh, and that's again Asians, blacks, and Latinos, and, and whites. And so, so if you just go and ask the people who live under it, they don't seem particularly concerned uh, uh, after years of, of experience with it that their rights are fundamentally dangerous. It's shocking how widespread the support is. Yes. So if you were to go to a state that does not have direct democracy, would the number be the same? These numbers are amazing. There actually was a survey, this institute that I was talking about that I'm in uh, charge of before I took over, did a survey in every state of the country and asked people, let me, let, let me go on, they asked people this, this question, you know, who should be making the most important policy decisions in the country? The people or, or the legislature? So it's, 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 it's a long state. Mm -hmm. And what you can see here, this is a very recent study, 2016, you can see here you get about two to one or three to one uh, saying the people should make the most important decision, not politicians. This study was done in every state, and every single state is two to one or three to one. So there's no difference between states with, so there's no experience of the right democracy yeah. that leads to a... It, it doesn't appear, and I didn't statistically do it, I, I, I bought the column because I was so, I, I thought some of the non-states, uh, often you'll hear in some states, you know, like the New York legislature will do these studies periodically, which will come out about how dangerous it would be to do direct democracy in, in New York and, and all these terrible and all these terrible things. So, so sometimes I go, well, maybe New York's just different, maybe because they don't, don't, don't like it. But actually, it's just the politicians don't, don't like it. So, um, <laughs> if you look, if you look at the regular voter state by state, there's, there's they're over, over um, So I know we only have questions, and so I'm going because I think I have one more, more, more slide here, and, I, and, and then I'll, and then I'll go to questions. But. Um, Another way to think about, you know, anarchy, I started off with anarchy and chaos, direct democracy leads to anarchy and chaos. So, and it, you know, it, we should be informed by the historical experience. So I think one of the cool uh, historical experiences, is let's imagine a country that's had direct democracy for 150 years and goes all in on it from top to bottom. So this is a country where uh, every single constitutional amendment has to be approved. Um, any sort of vote on collective security agreements, membership and supranational committees has to be approved. Uh, voters are allowed to propose amendments to the Constitution. Um, they can challenge international treaties. Every single law of the federal government can be challenged by a petition referendum. And all the subnational governments have initiative rights. Let's think about a country like that, okay? Uh, if there's ever one that's sort of going to descend into chaos, this looks like it, because they're gone all in. Okay, so what is this? This is the chaotic land of Switzerland. Okay? Uh, this is, in fact, our Constitution since 18, 1848. Uh, many of you have been there, it seems calm to me, it doesn't look like it's anarchy, it doesn't look like it's anarchy, it's a very wealthy country, uh, it, it seems like a free society, it seems like the things you want. Now, Switzerland's, uh, the immediate response is, well, we're, you know, this country's different than Switzerland, everybody's different, absolutely right. Uh, this doesn't mean that the U.S. would be the same or Italy would be the same if, if, you, if you imposed it on it. The point is that the notion that it's so, there's something inevitable about democ democracy that leads to anarchy and chaos is just simply not, not true. We, we've seen it work in many parts of the world. It's really an extreme case here for a very long time. So I'm going to take a couple minutes for questions. I'll just put this quote uh, from Thomas Jefferson up here because I started with founders. And I want to say one founder actually was much more worried about the politicians and the elites than, than the people. So there were some questions. Uh, yes. <coughs> about Switzerland, uh, there have been a couple of cases over the last 10 years where um, voters have voted to something that's, uh, that then uh, was, you know, people realized, that, well, the government realized that they couldn't apply because it was against human rights or against like, um, international treaties that had been signed. So is there a counterfactual where governments themselves vote for something that then is unapplicable? Uh, all the laws that are struck down by the Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah. If, I, if I understand your question, I mean, most, most systems have things that are out of bounds in their constitution or possibly even through an international agreement. And usually we rely on courts to take those off the table. So, so, so for example, in the U.S., even though we have direct democracy, certain things would, would, be, would, be, would be not be, in fact, they are struck down sometimes. Uh, 
because they violate some human rights. So yeah, yeah, that, that's very totally necessary. It's absolutely necessary. Let me go with that. Yeah, oh, I was just going to return, sorry, again to the slavery gym program, because I do think I, uh, after your last comment, I think I understood the point of raising it, but I think the other important thing to realize is that it just, if the, let's see, um, if that's an example of sort of like representative democracy isn't perfect, so we have to, like, we have to make a realistic comparison between these two things, I think it's also fair to say that at that point in time, it wouldn't be entirely appropriate to characterize the U.S.'s government system as a representative democracy, just because who, like, who was it representing? Certainly it wasn't, like, de facto, so many people didn't get to vote and stuff. So I did, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. yeah, that's all. It's, it's always, I, I mean, this is something I'm going to talk a little bit about more, more next time, but I do think that we, uh, the, the country, and I think most countries that are democracies continue to try to improve their, their democracy. We've made a dramatic change. We're not at all operating under the same system that was out in the Senate when only a small number of property white males were allowed to vote, for example. Um, we, we changed a whole bunch of things. But part of what I think about direct democracy is we sort of don't want to get ourselves in the mindset because the founders said something, we should never change it anymore. Because we've always changed it, and we should continue to seek certain things. Yeah. Um, just to go back to your point about the minority, whether you minority or not, um, you said you know, it that's not always the racial or ethnic group is not always the minority. And so if you look at the, 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 the makeup of some of these initiatives, a lot of these initiatives, they really cut on class and socioeconomic um, terms, not on racial or ethnic terms, although that might be, there might be an overlap. And so when you look at whether or not an initiative is, is favorable or unfavorable to the majority, you're looking at whether or not an initiative is like, you know, going to dis, dispossess you know, uh, a, a group of people who are counting on those tax revenues for schools or, or a group of people who are going to go, yippee, yeah, and make that issue to, to build a stadium, you know, in the suburbs or something. I mean, it seems like yeah. that's a more, that's a more yeah. um, uh, frequent minority constituency. I mean, it would just be interesting to sort yeah. of yeah. refine yeah. that, yeah. refine those surveys. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the concern about minority rights isn't that there's going to be somebody, by definition, somebody is going to lose. There's going to be a minority, and they didn't get, they didn't get what the other things what they want. So that's, that's baked into the whole notion of democracy. But I think the concern is there's certain situations where nobody should lose, where, where people should be protected, because you shouldn't be uh, lose your rights because of your race, for, for example. And so the, the, the minority rights question is, is really whether those sort of fundamental rights, and I mean rights as opposed to interests, Okay, where those fundamental rights are in danger because nobody wants to move to a system where sort of rights can be in danger. So that's why I was focusing on that. Yes. So you uh, brought up two practices, uh, competence and uh, responsibility. I just wonder, I'm curious to uh, hear your thoughts on the potential idea of implementing a tiered democracy system. By that I mean uh, people at different level have different competence of um, understanding different literatures. Um, maybe at a community level, you have a relative democracy where people, the majority of the people in that community, in that village, vote. But then once you escalate to kind of the constitution level, um, you have a more educated groups to vote on this. So you're going to deny votes to certain people at certain level? I, I, I guess I wouldn't go for that one. No, I'm talking about, talking about spectrum from representative to direct, depending on uh, the size and complexity. I, I, I might, might not be understanding, but, but I'm going to talk more next. Time I'm going to talk more about specific things I would like I would like to see done, for, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't think to be very clear, it would make sense to say let's throw away representative institutions and vote on everything. That would be a silly system. No, nobody wants that. And, and you can see that's not what we're really talking about here. We're talking about injecting it in particular points, uh, particularly for big issues. So I think that's the way to, to try to think about that. How do you expect to do it? I'd like to hear more of what you're talking about. Um, so I think that the question that we have is how does the Uh, yeah, so, so how do you as a voter figure out 
put through this. I mean, this is the hard problem in general, I think. Um, you know, candidates put up, you know, the presidential candidates put up last year uh, big giant websites with detailed position papers on, on all these things. My guess is nobody in the room ready, you know, so we decide what to vote. So, um, um, we, we're, we want to know whether we're voting on issues or whether we're voting on candidates. So the challenge is how do we find out what things is. Um, I, I think that you've got to ultimately find experts that you can rely on. And there might be different experts in different contexts. People still listen so much to the media. Obviously, there's blogs out there. If there's people that are experts that you just really think are good. Uh, but that's, that's the challenge. And I would argue that in some sense, that's the challenge of making the democracy work, is getting a rich set of cues out there so people can make decisions. Because we can't inform people in substantively, substantively, but we have to have expert opinion out there and available there. And I think it's, it's a challenging issue. But it's important. So. I think I should stop because we're going to go out of time. I, let, 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 can I talk to you afterwards? But I should stop because it's going to go. I'm over. I'm over. Let, let, let's, let's talk. <laughs> Thank you.